Jenny Teague was just in the wrong place, at the wrong time, and was attacked by a horrible monster. The human monster wasn't happy with his life, so he decided, to end someone else's life. Sadly, Jenny and her family, had to go through a lot of terrible things, because of this man's awful depression. But the truth is, even in the safest neighborhoods, monsters, are lurking behind you, in the shadows. In 1987, Jennifer Teague was born in Nova Scotia, Canada. Jenny was the youngest and only girl in her family. She was very girly and loved shopping, but she was also very athletic and able to stand up for herself. She was tough and would take no crap, but she was also kind and generous. Jenny's dad was in the army and a year before she was born, the family moved from Nova Scotia to Ontario. Sadly, her parents decided to split up, and so Jenny and her brothers moved with their mother to Barhaven. It's a great place for families with beautiful homes that all look the same, great schools, and everything you need to shop for. In 2005, things were still getting better, even though Jenny's parents were no longer together. She and her brothers stayed close to their father, who had remarried and moved close by. Jenny was a smart and smart young woman, but she had trouble learning in a traditional classroom. When she was in the 10th grade, she transferred to Elizabeth Wynwood, an alternative school. Her grades got better, and she became more involved as a student. She even joined a group called Earth Care that went to elementary schools to talk to younger kids about how to protect the environment. Jenny was a big influence on the people she went to school with, and she made many friends there. Things were going well. Jenny was about to start her last year of high school, and she liked working part-time at Wendy's near her house. She loved shopping, especially with her mom. Jen worked a late-night shift at Wendy's restaurant on September 8, 2005. The restaurant wasn't too far from her home in Bar Haven, so she always walked to and from work. Nothing exciting ever happened in the small town, and her mother never really worried about her safety. So Jen walking home alone so late at night probably wouldn't have been a big deal. It was about 1 a.m. when she met up with some of her friends at Max Milk after finishing her shift. After a short smoke break, she continued walking. However, after saying goodbye to her friends, Jenny was never seen alive again. When Jenny didn't come home from work, her family knew right away that something was wrong. They tried to call her on her cell phone, but it was off. Upon learning she had been missing and no one knew where she was, her friends and co-workers called the cops. However, the police didn't take it seriously at first. Jenny was an 18-year-old girl, so the police thought at first that she was probably just out with friends, or she might have run off on her own. But her family kept pushing, knowing that something bad must have happened, because Jenny always came home and stayed in touch with her family. Eventually, it became clear that Jennifer Teague had not run away, and a huge search began to find her. Her family put up flyers all over Barhaven. People also started to panic, because people don't usually go missing in Barhaven. Soon enough, police joined the search and started talking to people door to door to find out what they knew or what they saw. Police would use canines and helicopters to look for the missing teen. A command center was set up in the parking lot of a nearby church. Even though they looked everywhere, they didn't find anything. Jenny's friends and family were all asked a lot of questions, only to point out one of her co-workers. Police then paid close attention to a Wendy's employee. They heard he liked her, but she didn't like him back. Indeed, when they talked to him, they saw some cuts on his neck and face. He said he cut himself shaving. He also said he had offered to walk Jenny home that night, but she told him not to worry about it because she was meeting up with friends. The police backed up what he said and gave him a polygraph test, which he passed. So he was ruled out as a possible suspect. After talking to Jenny's friends that she had met up with that night at Max Milk, one of them mentioned seeing a creepy car in the parking lot. Jenny knew this person in the car, whom she didn't like very much. This individual had a history of stalking, and his ex-girlfriend had a restraining order against him, so the police appeared to have a solid lead. During the interview, the guy seemed very suspicious and aggressive when it came to Jenny's disappearance. 
so they asked him to take a polygraph test, which he did, and he passed it. And now, after ruling out another suspect, the police didn't really know where to look next. Then, ten days after Jenny went missing, a police officer was walking with his family when he found a naked woman's body in the Stony Swamp Conservation Area. The body had been dumped about five kilometers away from where Jenny had gone missing. The body looked like it had been there for a while, and that could be seen on the badly decomposed body. And so the search was stopped, and a murder investigation was started. Police now believe there was a killer out there who killed a young woman as she walked home, and then dumped her body. Even though the police didn't have any clues about the suspect, they put out a sketch of whom they thought the killer was. At the same time, it looks like anyone and like no one. Even though Jenny's friends and family said the person didn't look like anyone they knew, the sketch did bring in a lot of new tips. The next move was from Wendy's Canada, where Jenny worked, which offered a reward of $50,000 for any information that led to the killer being caught. The Ottawa police decided to double that reward, bringing the total to $100,000. They were hoping that it would get someone to come forward with new information, but nothing really important came out of it. The next month, in May 2006, police released 24 photos of people taken right from the surveillance video at the convenience store Jenny went to that night, Max Milk. Initially, it works, but then something unexpected happens. On June 9, Kevin Davis and his girlfriend were eating mushrooms and having a great time. In his hallucinations, Kevin felt like he had a religious experience that made him say everything was bothering him. So he starts to tell a story, but it was so scary and horrible that his girlfriend gets in her car and drives away. Meanwhile, Kevin starts losing it, and he's getting hot, so he takes off all of his clothes. Then he runs out onto Fallowfield Road, a busy street in Barhaven, and lies in the middle of traffic. When a car comes up behind him and stops, Kevin starts yelling that he killed Jennifer Teague. Even though the man didn't believe him, the man called 911 because it was clear that Kevin was in some kind of serious trouble. A few days later, in the hospital, the police asked him what he was talking about, but sober Kevin tells them he doesn't know anything about the case and he was just high and talking nonsense. Unexpectedly, he was let go because the police believed him. But the guilt keeps eating him up. So a few weeks after what happened with the mushrooms, Kevin Davis decides it's time to try to turn himself in for real this time. He goes over to his neighbor's house and tells him to call 911 because he killed Jennifer. The man rushed inside the house to call the police and Kevin keeps going around telling anyone who will listen that he murdered Jennifer Teague. He goes to a shopping center and talks to a police officer who is not on duty. That's where he was arrested without any trouble. Kevin Davis was 24 years old when Jennifer went missing. He worked at a pizza place and lived with his mother in Barhaven. He lived behind a baseball field that police used as a landing spot when searching for Jennifer. Kevin was a big, tall man, so it would be easy for him to beat Jennifer. People have called him a loner, maybe a loser. As a child he had a hard time fitting in because he was always bigger and a bit awkward. He lived with his mother, but he said he didn't get along well with her. He had trouble with girls, didn't like being turned down, and had just ended a serious but bad relationship. He was angry and sad, and he would write poems about how women are awful. Once they got Kevin back to the police station, they tried to get him a lawyer, but he didn't need one, he'd answer every question. The police read him his rights twice, Kevin then started to explain what happened in more detail. Kevin began to get ready weeks before the attack. He wanted to take someone back, because so many things had been taken away from him. So he tore up bed sheets into strips, that could be used to tie someone up. As he felt sad and played video games at home, the thought of kidnapping someone kept coming up in his head. On the night of the murder, he was supposed to go play video games with his friend, but instead, he decided this would be the night he would take someone. He put on black jogging pants and a blue hooded sweatshirt, got into his mother's Pontiac Sunfire, and drove around Barhaven, 
looking for a young woman to kidnap. That's when he drove by Max Milk and saw Jennifer and her friends sitting outside. He thought he might have met her a few times at the church near both of their homes. She fit the description of what he was looking for, she was pretty, small, and could easily be controlled. So he pulled into the parking lot, and watched her for a while until she left alone. Kevin wasn't sure what he was going to do, but the thoughts of kidnapping and killing kept coming to his mind. He waited until she was walking on a dark path near the train tracks. This was a path he had taken many, many times at night. Jenny was walking toward both her home and Kevin's since the two lived pretty close to each other. So Kevin drove quickly home, parked the car, and ran back to meet Jenny on the path. He brought with him a military-style knife that he bought at the local Walmart, pieces of torn-up sheets, green nylon, and a sock that he had prepared. Kevin told her that he wouldn't hurt her as long as she did what he said. Then he pushed her to the ground, tied her hands and feet together, covered her eyes with a blindfold, and put the sock in her mouth. He looked in her backpack to see if she had any money or drugs he could take. He found her discman and cell phone, which he turned off just in case. After looking through her things, he untied her feet so he could walk her back to his house, which wasn't far away. When he took the sock out of her mouth, she asked him if he was going to rape her, hurt her, or kill her. He told her no and then asked her about her family, like if she had any brothers or sisters. She probably hoped that if she tried to be his friend, he wouldn't hurt her if she answered all of his questions. Kevin could understand when Jenny talked about her brothers and how her parents had split up. He kept the knife pointed at her as they walked, but he says he never touched her with it. After a short walk, they went through the back gate and back door to get to Kevin's house. Kevin's mother was sleeping upstairs, and it was about 1.30 a.m. He told Jenny to be quiet as he led her up to his bedroom. Here is where he untied her, took off her clothes, and then tied her back up. He put the sock back in her mouth and blindfolded her this time. Kevin didn't know what he was going to do next, so he sat next to her on the bed and smoked a cigarette. At one point, the sock in her mouth made it hard for her to breathe, so he took it out. She then asked for a glass of water, which he got for her from the bathroom. She took a sip, but then threw up. The plans and ideas were always sexual, but Kevin said that he couldn't get an erection with her in his room. So, he touched her breasts and digitally penetrated her, but then he said he couldn't go any further. He thought about what to do for a while as he sat there. He thought he should let her go, but he was also worried that she would tell the police. He finally decided that he had to kill her, and he remembers the last thing Jenny said was, I have to leave soon, or my mom will worry. Then he sat her up and used one of the pieces of bedsheet fabric to strangle her from behind until she stopped breathing. Kevin said, I want everyone to know that I didn't rape or beat her. I'm not a bad person. After he killed her, he cleaned her body and tried to get rid of any of his hair or fingerprints that might have been on it. Then he wrapped her body in a quilt that his grandmother had made for him, dragged it down the stairs, and put it in the trunk of his mother's car. His mother was upstairs sleeping when all of this happened, and she didn't hear a thing. Kevin then drove around looking for a place away from people where he could dump her body. Then he dragged her body to the lime kiln trail and dumped it face down. He took off all the fabric ties that were around her and the gag that was in her mouth. Then he went home and put Jennifer's clothes in a trash bag. The next morning, they were picked up with the rest of the trash. Initially, they weren't sure if this was a real guy because he kept saying different things. Initially, he had an alibi, then he ate mushrooms and said he killed her, then he denied it, and finally admitted it. For their peace of mind, they asked him to prove he was the real killer. As a memorial to Jennifer, Kevin Davis still had the quilt his grandmother had made for him. Besides Jennifer's CD player, he still had her bag at his mother's house, which he had taken the night of the murder. 
So Kevin Davis was accused of killing Jennifer Teague. Thankfully, Kevin Davis agreed to plead guilty to murder again during the preliminary trial. He had seen and heard the pain on the faces and in the voices of Jennifer's family, and he didn't want to cause them any more pain by having a long, in-depth trial. Kevin Davis admitted his guilt on January 25, 2008, and he was given a sentence of life in prison without the chance of parole for 25 years. The Teague family wanted to know why he did this, but he didn't tell them. Thank you for being here, and please always be careful.